Hello friends, welcome to my new series, Yarns, Conversations with Cruisers. Um, this is a new podcast available in both video and audio format, where I just sit down with people I meet and hear their stories. Uh, I plan on doing this as I make my way around the world. None of these interviews are scheduled ahead of time. It's just people that I happen to meet, I find them interesting, and I ask them if they would like to sit down and um, tell me some of their sea stories. I hope you enjoy the video. You can also find the audio version wherever you get your podcast from. Um, and let me know down in the comments what you think. Wild. Yeah, in Newfoundland, we wintered over on a pier, and the ice was so thick you could, we could walk off the boat and all the way out into the middle of the fjord. And then the icebreakers cut a path to get, because we were way up this long fjord, to get to the town. Mm -hmm. But you could ski or skate, depending on the conditions, like way out, just walk out of the harbor past the break wall. And then towards the end of the winter, the boat started to get squeezed out of the ice. Whoa. Because it was so... Just being pushed up? Yeah, so then my Whoa. parents would go with an axe and try to axe away at the ice around the boat to keep it down. Wow. And we slowly got pushed away from the pier. So halfway through the winter, my dad built this gangway because we couldn't get off the boat anymore. When I was a little lass, my mother up and told me Way, all the way, we'll all the way, Joe Someday your love will call and take you out to sea. We way, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Hello, friends. I'm here with Holly Martin. We are on her boat, Gecko. Mm -hmm. And um, we are in New Zealand. <clears throat> Um, if you're not familiar with Holly, she has a YouTube channel called Wind Hippie Sailing, and her story is pretty wild. <laughs> so, I wanted to have her on, we're going to have a conversation, as always, and um, get into the sort of nuts and bolts as to what she's doing, and uh, go from there. So, will you tell them what your boat is, how big it is, uh, and whatnot? Yes. So my boat is a Grind 27, which is a Danish design, Danish built, little double ender, transom hung rudder, fin keel. Um, I bought it in the States, in New England, and spent about 10 months refitting it to get it ready for this trip. Um, I redid the rig, I added spreaders, I dipped all the wiring, I rebuilt the whole cabin. This is all handcrafted on me. <laughs> <laughs> this very cheap marine grid pine that's covered in epoxy. Yep, yep, very fancy. And then what year is the boat? It's 81. 81. Yeah. Oh, and that's the Bernie I was telling you about with the logo. Oh the yeah, logo I looked it up this morning. So yeah. yeah, Holly just got a new cell from Rolly Tasker yesterday in Mainsail. And there was a logo on top, and I asked her, I was like, oh, what is that image? And, and <laughs> it's the, this, the, what is it? The Grind? The Grind. Grind I didn't logo. recognize it, even though that Burgi has been in my cabin that for three years. Hilarious. And I stare at it all the time, because it's a tiny boat. I was like, I don't know what that is. That is funny. <laughs> yeah. So, solo sailing, you left Maine mm -hmm. in 2018. Yeah. And do you know how many miles you've done? Uh, no. I've tried to calculate it in my head. <laughs> I don't keep track. <laughs> yeah, I didn't figure, dude. Um, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but let's let's first get into the sort of like foundation of all this all mm -hmm. because this this is like a really fascinating aspect to me. You were born here in New Zealand. Yeah. On your parents' circumnavigation. Yeah. Now, your parents, Dave and Jaja, mm -hmm. they circumnavigated on a Cal Twenty Five. And ended up having three kids in route. Yeah. On a 25 foot boat. So, you know, eight meter boat. That is bonkers. Um, which is pretty amazing. So you were born here in New Zealand. And then as we spoke last night, you said you did, obviously, as a young person, like when, what are your earliest memories of where were you sailing when you first start remembering? Um, I kind of start remembering on the passage to Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, so we sailed from Bermuda to Iceland. When my sister was born, she was actually born on the Cal 25. Okay. Um, my dad delivered her. They didn't, their midwife sort of 
backed out a month before wow. the delivery and my mom was like you know i've already had two yeah, yeah. why don't you just read the book and, it's old hat yeah <laughs> and i woke up uh after my like i remember my sister was born my dad was holding her my mom hadn't been to the doctor for the entire pregnancy because mm -hmm. in north carolina it was illegal to have a baby out of the hospital wow so she had to pretend like it just accidentally happened but she was worried if she went to the hospital for anything they would know that she was pregnant yeah so they didn't know what gender my sister mm -hmm. was so i remember my mom asking and my dad was like it's a girl and then i got up and i cut the cord wow yeah and now how old were you at that point i was four <laughs> so i have these little memories of it but and, i yeah and that was north carolina yeah and that was on the 25 that was on the 25 Cal and what was the name of that boat direction yeah and then wow. they got a 33 footer for the five of us mm -hmm. steel um, my dad took everything out like you're supposed to do when you buy a steel boat and to check the hull and then he built the whole interior himself and he kind of designed it around this massive diesel heater mm -hmm. and then we sailed to the arctic so i kind of my formative memories really begin on that passage and then for the whole arctic that was a 33 foot yeah. steel boat right yeah mm -hmm. and so you guys what was your arctic like you guys left from bermuda bermuda mm -hmm. And sailed to Iceland. Iceland. Yeah. And then from Iceland to Norway or, or to Yeah, so we wintered over in Iceland and then wow. in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the summer we sailed um over to the Shetlands and the Faroes and then up to the Lofoten Islands, which are above the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. And wintered over for that year Ice the Bowden. Wow. And then the next summer sailed down to Scotland area and then came back up to Lofoten and did another winter there, but instead we stayed in a, um, it's called the Postita, which is like a post hut. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it had, it was uninsulated, like this tiny little cabin. We would pack snow around the foundation to try to insulate it, wow. but it was just always freezing cold. So mm -hmm. we were constantly in sweaters and there were holes in the floor and my parents' room, I think had holes in the floor. Um, but we stayed there for that winter. And then the next summer we sailed uh, up to Svalbard and then wow. Greenland, Labrador, Newfoundland, Maine was kind of the trick. That's awesome. Yeah. And so when you went to Scotland, was it the Orkneys that you went to or? I have no idea. Yeah. That's just, the thing about being yeah. a kid. You just, right. you're just like, you're we're like, in some castles. new place that's castles, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, it's crazy. I've, I think, yeah, I've listened to the interview with Reverend Bob Shepton about overwintering mm -hmm. in the ice. And yeah. it just sounds so bonkers. It is yeah. so intense. I mean, obviously you can only do that in a steel or aluminum boat. Yeah. But wild. Yeah, in Newfoundland, we wintered over on a pier and the ice was so thick. You could, we could walk off the boat and all the way out into the middle of the fjord. And then the icebreakers cut a path to get, because we are way up this long fjord to get to the town. Mm -hmm. But you could ski or skate depending on the conditions like way out, just walk out of the harbor past the break wall. And then towards the end of the winter, the boat started to get squeezed out of the ice. Whoa. Cause it was so, so it's being pushed up. Yeah. So then my oh. parents would go with an ax and try to ax away at the ice around the boat to keep it down. Wow. And we slowly got pushed away from the pier. So halfway through the winter, my dad built this gangway because we couldn't get off the boat anymore. Whoa. And there's not really much you can do about it. So we had this yeah. cool, like yeah. that is, and then, so what year would you say that was? That was 2002, I think, was mm -hmm. Newfoundland. Because mm -hmm. you're 30 right now. 31. You're 31. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and PBS did a documentary about her parents called Ice Blink and about your childhood. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, and the sailing channel TV, you can do pay-per-view to watch that documentary. Um, I'll put the link to that in the description. And her parents wrote a book about their whole experience, which there'll also be the link to the book in the description of this video. Um, so then let's jump forward to you're in your early 20s and you get a job mm -hmm. working on research vessels in Antarctica based yeah. in Chile. Yeah. So will you talk a bit about that? Like, how did that come about? And just, you know. Yeah. Well, I knew I wanted my own boat, so I thought <laughs> I should get jobs where I could learn all the skills I needed to have my own boat. Um, and I just, I was really good at talking myself into jobs. So I did tall ships for a year and I kind of talked my way into a paid position aboard the tall ship. Um, and then it was the same with the Antarctica job. I bothered them for probably six months, mm -hmm. just like emails, phone calls. And then one day I got a call and they were like, Hey, can you fly down in two weeks? 
to do this trip because someone backed out and I didn't know but that's how they operate mm -hmm. um, and I said sure uh, <laughs> dropped everything that I had going on did all the physicals flew down and then um, yeah I guess it worked out I fit into the crew and I was willing to learn so mm -hmm. they hired me officially and then I did that contracts for them for four years four years so you were based in Chile on a research vessel what was the name of the vessel so there are two it's the the Nathaniel B Palmer and the Lawrence M Gould and then do you remember how big those boats were yeah I think they're like 300 something like that mm -hmm. yeah and so we would my commute to work was flying 36 hours from <laughs> Maine <laughs> <laughs> to, to southern Chile mm -hmm. and then um, we got paid for the travel time and they bought our tickets and like we had agents it was cool you know we'd show up to the airport in Santiago and Jimmy would come out with his clipboard and pull, pull us through all the lines and I remember once there was a riot because uh, there was a strike and we got to baggage claim and you couldn't move it was shoulder to shoulder none of the people were working so no one was getting cleared in and there was just chaos and then i see this jimmy with shorts like little clipboard above the crowd and jimmy comes pushing his way out like <laughs> That's grabbed amazing. us yeah so then we would arrive sleep that night and then work a full day the next day and that was um, we worked seven days a week 12 hour shifts so it was pretty full on <laughs> and you guys were running crew and supplies to the science bases in Antarctica, is that correct? Yeah. And then also doing research. Yeah, so on the way down, the passage was crossing the Drake to get down to the ice, we called it. And on the way, we would bring personnel and supplies for the station, do a day there with cargo, and then we'd go off and do our own science cruise for a month and a half, go to the station again and bring people back wow. to Chile. And that was that kind of is incredible i remember in my 20s i looked into even trying to get a job as like a cook at that station mm. or driving a forklift or anything i yeah. remember yeah looking into it back then um that was like the late 90s uh that's fantastic so have you read iceberg by david lewis no you should read it because he sailed he tried to do the first circumnavigation of antarctica on a 27 foot boat <laughs> and he sailed down <laughs> and like his stories about being wow. like in the ice on this little boat and yeah it's fascinating he's also the one that he wrote we the navigators where he worked with the the final polynesian wayfinders and he did oh, all the documentation of that's cool you know in the, in the 60s yeah. um so that book ice ice bird mm -hmm. i think you would really appreciate it because you'll have such a visual and a knowledge of the landscape yeah true that you'll be able to gain more from that book than any of the rest of us who have not been that sort of environment. Also, can I just say, I would never take a 27 foot <laughs> boat to Antarctica. I, That's I crazy. Mean, I, That's so I cool. will someday sit, you know, or go to visit Antarctica, but not on Tritea, that is for sure. Yeah, hell no. I yeah. would want to be on someone else's e boat, first exactly, of all. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's really cool. So you were working, and then what happened with the end of that job? Oh, yeah. So I, about halfway through it, I bought my boat. Um, I actually bought my boat because I broke my arm and I was mountain biking in the Philippines and I had to fly back to the States for surgery and I had just lived this really transient life. I was either doing contracts at work and then I would be done with that and I would backpack and mm -hmm. then I would, so it was like blah blah blah, never stopping and then suddenly I was stuck in Maine at my parents' house for two months mm -hmm. and with a like an elbow cast and uh, I just started boat shopping because I had always wanted a boat but never really had the time to to actually find one right and then my dad got really excited with me we started looking at boats and I just started looking in boat yards in increasingly large circles <laughs> from my parents house mm -hmm. and then found this boat and my dad and I drove three hours to go look at it and it was mm -hmm. I just love it for sight I loved it yeah. I didn't know anything about sailboats really in the sense of owning one but I just saw it and I was like this looks nice and then my dad who's a professional Mariner. He's a surveyor. He does too, surveys. Right? Mm -hmm. He does everything. So he did a full survey of it, and then I was really hoping he was going to approve because ultimately, you know, if he didn't say it was good, I wasn't going to get it. And then mm -hmm. we were both like, this is the boat. <laughs> yeah, it's a great boat. It's yeah. interesting too because it's fin keel but with a skeg hung rudder. Yeah. Which that's the only way I would own a fin keel boat is if it had a skeg hung rudder. Yeah. So. Yeah, I love it. I can just leave the helm and it, it stays, whereas my friends without mm -hmm. the skeg. If you let go of the tiller, the boat just instantly veers up into the wind. Yeah. So this is for solo sailing. It's amazing. And so had you done much solo sailing before you started 
refitting this? Zero. Other than maybe on dinghies or something? None whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And so what was your first solo passage? Did you like pop around Maine and kind of get your bearings or? Um, I mean, you're kind of wild, so. I did two day sails by myself mm -hmm. and then I left Maine to sail to North Carolina. <laughs> That's like... what I figured you <laughs> That's exactly what I figured you would say. It's like, nah, I just kind of jumped off the cliff. Um, yeah, my dad, the two days before I left, um, my dad took me out for a sail, like a 45 minute sail and taught me how to use the wind vane, which mm -hmm. I'd never used before. And then, then, yeah, then I left and I sort of figured it out the mm -hmm. rest of the way at sea. But yeah. That took a while. I had to come up with a little rhyme to remember which way to pull the line to adjust the the thing on the top. Yeah. Um, I mean, still, like, I just kind of guess. <laughs> I cannot. I only have two lines, but for some reason I can never remember which one I'm supposed to. I'm like, I just pull it. If it goes the wrong way, I pull it together. Oh, I can only do it with my left hand. My right hand doesn't know, but it's always the left one that I that use. That is hilarious. <laughs> so when I'm trying to teach someone my wind van and they ask me which direction to pull it, I have to close my yeah, eyes exactly. and pretend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that is funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, when, like, what was your mindset? What was your idea once you had gotten the boat together and you're like, okay, I'm going to just go sailing? Yeah. So, was that it? It was just open ended? I'm just going to go cruise? Yeah, I kind of, I sort of figured I would circumnavigate, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, the plan was just to live on my boat and see new things exactly. and head west, but without any, like I had no timeline. The joy of living on a boat is that you don't have to have a timeline. Exactly. Um, and that was what I wanted. I just wanted to experience what it was. And then like Polynesia, I meant to be there three months and I was there two years. And if I had been on a schedule, maybe that would have been stressful. But instead I was like, well, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, Scale. Yeah. Schedules and sailing don't mix. No, no, they don't. But especially for us, we have open-ended lives where we don't have other, we're not, we don't have X amount of time off work to where we have to get to a place to make this done. Like we yeah. get to, if we have, it's more relaxing for us because we can just decide what we want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so now you're fully funded by your, your YouTube channel mm -hmm. and your patrons. Yeah. So what had you planned on doing? Were you just planning on sailing and then finding work along the way? Yeah. So I left with $2,000. Um, and sailed to the Caribbean, and for the first couple of months, I just, I mean, I didn't eat out, I didn't drink, I didn't really spend money on anything other than the basic food things, and I was trying, like, everything I was trying to do for free, and, because uh, I didn't know, I don't know, I figured I'd run out of money and then just figure it out, yep. and to me that was part of the adventure, mm -hmm. and then I started my YouTube channel, and I started my Patreon, and it started filtering in the money, but I was still like, I don't know, maybe I'll go to Mexico and work a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, I can work on boats. That's the only skills that I have. I've only ever worked on boats my whole life. So being on a boat, I knew that I was in the right place. Like the Caribbean, you can do charter stuff. I, yeah, know. Totally. I just wasn't worried about it. That was a thing with me too. I left LA, I only had $1,000 in my savings, but I didn't have any debt. And the boat was refit. Yeah. So I was like, well, yeah, and I, I have my like master's license with the US Coast Guard. so. I got that thinking that I would just be doing yacht deliveries or driving dive boats. Yeah. I was like, when I run out of money, because I never thought my channel would fully fund me. So I was like, when I run out of money, then I'll just yeah, drive boats or deliver boats. Yeah, yeah, same thing. And it just worked out the way it worked out for us. Um, and so what? when did you decide to start the channel and how did that come about? Yeah, I don't know. It's funny because when I was refitting my boat, I did film a lot mm -hmm. on my, I did like a little iPhone, but I didn't do anything with it. I think because my parents were articles for oh. sailing mm -hmm. magazines when they were circumnavigating and that's how they funded themselves. So mm -hmm. I had it in my head that that was possible. Yep. And the dream was to have a YouTube channel that funded me. Mm -hmm. I never thought it would. Yeah. But I think I just wanted to try it and see what would happen. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and I hated it for the first year. Um, it is definitely hard work. It yeah. Makes every, especially projects, it makes everything take four times longer. Oh, projects. It's the <laughs> I know. Worst. Yeah. All you want to do is do the thing, but instead you're like, all right, I'm going to put the it camera is. here, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do this over here, and then I'm going to talk about it, and all I want to do is throw something. <laughs> it is beyond frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does make everything take longer, but then I'm like, all right, but also I wouldn't be able to buy this thing if I didn't film and show people what I'm doing. Yeah. That's how I make my money. Especially now that 
you know, it is our full time jobs. Yeah. Filming's a lot easier. <laughs> it is. It's a lot easier now. In the yeah. early days, like it was really and again I filmed the first six seasons on an iPhone. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, and I was too shy to talk on camera at first and I felt like an idiot and whatever and Yeah. But I just wanted to share what I was seeing. I was like, Well, it'd be fun to share this with like my friends and family and Yeah, that was I was like yeah. here mom <laughs> watch yeah, exactly. this video. So and so you started where did you start your channel? When you did you start it before you left, or did it after you got to the Caribbean? Um, no, I think I started it in Puerto Rico. Okay. That was my first Caribbean mm -hmm. island. And then in Antigua, I started my Patreon. Cool. Yeah, cause I remember that day, because that night, I, I'd i met these people. I was in this little anchorage with a resort. Like, the only thing in it was a resort on a beach. And these people came out in their kayak, and I was like, hey, come on board. And we chatted, and they, they were on this big retreat, and they snuck me into the resort because they were having a big party that night. And um, I remember just, like, riding this high because I'd started my Patreon, and I was like, I'm making $20 a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. And so now how many videos have you produced? Do you know? Oh, I do know. Something like 115. Yeah. Yeah. And you do, right now you're doing two videos a month. Yeah, one every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, you know, like, one of the fascinating things to me that I was thinking about with you mm -hmm. is that you're second generation small boat sailing serious adventurer. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know many of those. I know a lot about sailing and I know a lot about, you know, all my heroes are from the 60s, but... I mean, the Smeaton's daughter went on to do some sailing, but, and I'm sure there's lots out there, but yeah. I think a lot of times people that grow up with that lifestyle tend to navigate away to something more stable. Yeah. Know? So that's pretty fascinating that, you know, obviously it's in your blood and, and you said in articles, like you're the happiest on a boat, like yeah. you feel the most at home on oh, a boat. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So that's pretty fascinating. And the fact that like your parents, your parents did stuff on par or even more insane than so many of the really well-known sailors like the Pardees, the Smeatons, the Roths, all these yeah. people but you know maybe they were just like <clears throat> more focused on living yeah and less focused on like getting it out there that what they were doing and yeah. and I often say that about this podcast is one of the reasons Holly's actually the first like well-known sailor that I've interviewed everybody else I've interviewed have been like they would consider themselves ordinary people. Um, and that's what's interesting. For every, like, yeah. one of us, how many, you know, there's so yeah. many other people doing the same thing. Well, when you're us, you meet everyone and we're exactly. all doing the same thing. Yep. And so it doesn't feel special because you're all doing it together. Mm -hmm. And it, it's cool. I like it. Yeah. but And we were talking about this last night at dinner. It's, like, such an amazing community. And you end up meeting, you cruise with the same people because we're all cruising the trade winds. Yeah. So it's, like, you see the same boats all over the place. And, um, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so let's talk about some of your... I'm of, so impressed that you're keeping this all in your head. <laughs> yeah, this is what I do. Um, let's talk about some of your wild stuff. Let's talk about your sail to... Did, you didn't stop the Galapagos, right? You no. sailed straight to the Marquesas. Yeah. So let's talk about that sail. Yeah. How long was that sail? And the, what was it? Probably 3,300 miles or something. Oh, it was 4,000 4, miles. 4,000. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that was 41 days. 41 days. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, what was the what were the ups and downs of that passage? Well, the first two weeks <laughs> really sucked because that, that was trying to get past the Galapagos, and mm -hmm. there you have a really strong current against you. Mm -hmm. And so I was sailing rail in the water, making three knots wow and the, yeah With, the humboldt current is that the humboldt current that humboldt is once you get to the galapagos oh, this okay. is i don't know it's like the i hate sailors current i don't know what it's okay. called <laughs> but yeah that that sucked and it was headwinds so i was i was trying so hard to get south of the galapagos mm -hmm. and it took me two weeks to go a thousand miles i think wow. and it was just cloudy every day my batteries were dying so i couldn't run my ais receive mm -hmm. as much as i wanted to um, there's a lot of fishing, illegal fishing happening in those waters too. Yeah, right? but those people don't transmit anyway. I, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And yeah, so that was just hard. And then when I finally got to the Galapagos, I had to go north of it because I couldn't make the tack angles to go south of it. And then I got becalmed. <laughs> right, because that's the ITZZ, the doldrums. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the I was in the wind shadow. It was cool. I woke up and I saw the sunrise over the Galapagos. Wow. I saw the sea lions and snakes and sharks. And there was so much wildlife. Wow. And then I motored for... 32 hours my tiller pilot believe it or not was broken <laughs> mm. and so I was on the helm for a day and a half it really sucked I crossed the equator and I didn't even notice because I was so tired I was right. just like <laughs> mm -hmm. you're not able to like lash it and I guess the seas kind of throw you in all yeah directions. not really mm -hmm. no if there's no wind then I'm just kind of yeah. on the helm mm -hmm. so that was a marathon and then I got into the trades and then that was really really awesome and everything kind of smoothed out and yeah there was I was I would say every three days, I would get basically becalmed, usually at night. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have amazing wind, but it's better than having insanely horrible strong yeah, wind. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Yeah. And you also, I found I got so spoiled in the trades. Yeah. That, you know, and we'll get to that when the, the, the turning left thing. But so, Glop, so you got to the Marquesas, 40 days, pretty insane. That must have been a, quite a landfall. To come and to see those after that stretch of time alone. One of the most amazing feelings in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really special. And so, let's, and me and you have talked about this before, but let's talk about your sleep schedule. Mm -hmm. Because it's pretty intense compared to what I do. Yeah, I feel like I'm doing it wrong now that I've talked to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's whatever works for whomever, but, yeah. you know. So you talk about what you normally do when you're solo, Yeah. what your watch schedule is. Yeah, so normally I wake up every 40 minutes. Um, I usually do it like a 12 hour period of sleeping, sleeping. Mm -hmm. And then, but the 40 minutes, if it's good weather, all I do is I open one eye and I look at my iPad and I'm like, mm, still on course. Um, and then I go back to sleep. So I'm only half waking up yeah, anyway. Totally. But I find that if I sleep longer than that, I get into a deeper sleep. And mm -hmm. then I don't wake up if something happens. Mm -hmm. But if I do the 40 minutes, I stay half aware of everything. Like, I'll wake up 20 seconds before a squall hits. Because even though I'm sleeping, I can sense the boat is changing. And yep. that gives me just enough time to run out and take the headsail down. Mm -hmm. And if I sleep longer than that, I'm less tuned in. And that's why I do the and the short this, naps. Is, this is a good point to talk about. Polly has Hank on sail. She doesn't have a furler. So that means her shortening sail is a much bigger obstacle than it is for me. I just furl in my head sole. Yeah. I pay out pay out the main when a squall hits, because squalls hit every night. Yeah. And they're real mean at night for whatever reason. Because you're tired. They're yeah, <laughs> they're just stronger at night. But but I mean, that, for me, my sleep schedule from night, I start my night shift at 9 p.m. I, when I'm, when my AAS is working, uh, when I'm receiving AAS and I can get alarms, I sleep for two hours. My alarm goes off every two hours. I get up, check the course, mm -hmm. you know, go out, you know, see what's up with the, you know, make sure everything's okay, and then right back to sleep, same yeah. thing. Um, and that works great for me. When I my passage from LA to Hawaii, my AIS failed, so I did every hour yeah. I got up and checked. But again, the funny thing is, it's so frustrating because you never see anyone. Oh, that I don't ever check for ships. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. That's the thing about the forty minutes. I don't yeah. get up unless I have to. You just to. check your course and then. That's. But it. it's funny what you're saying about the squalls because there's always that like almost always that slight calm. Yeah. And, like, once things get chill, you know you're about to get your ass kicked. It's like... And I can tell when my boat goes off course and with the wind vane, mm -hmm. when the wind picks up, it starts to turn up into the wind. Mm -hmm. And I can feel that. When I was sailing with my sister and I was like, yeah, play around with the wind vane, figure out how it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was lying below and, like, every time she'd fiddle with it, I'd wake up and yep. I was like, we're off course. Yep. And I'd go back to sleep and then five minutes later, we're off course. And I was like, mm -hmm. ah, <laughs> it's okay, there's someone in the cockpit. Yeah. <laughs> She's figuring it out. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. What's funny, too, I am I visited with Matt Rutherford when I was in Annapolis last year and we were talking about being tuned into your boat like that yeah and he said laying in his bunk he can tell you the speed of the boat and the speed of the wind better than he can stand in a cockpit wow 
from the sound and the movement. Yeah. And I find that to be true as well. Like I can listen to the sound and know how fast we're going. And, and there's like sounds in the rigging where I know the wind speed just from the sounds. And it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's cool. I can tell anything about my boat from being down below yeah. and sleeping. Like I, once I had all the hatches closed cause it was squally and the fan on cause it was hot and it was like blowing 25, 30. So it's loud in the boat. And I, I was like, something's outside. So I got up and I checked and there was no ships, nothing, but I could feel it mm -hmm. in me. And I looked up and it was an airplane flying overhead and I had heard it in like, I don't know that like the vibrations, right. I was so tuned in to my boat. Isn't like, that something amazing? Yeah. yeah. You can definitely be like, something is happening. Yeah. yeah. So, so wild. Um, let's talk about hallucinations. Um, so do you get many like aural or like audio hallucinations? Um, not a ton, but definitely yes. On all my longer passages, yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. And I had the, the most recent one was on the passage to Fiji. I had, I was in this bunk with the lee cloths up on both sides. Um, and I woke up and I, I was by myself, but I, it was like I was existing in two worlds, the world where I knew I was alone and the world where I knew my sister was sleeping in that bunk mm -hmm. and I could hear her breathing. I could sense that she was there mm -hmm. and I had just laid there cause it was really comforting. Cause I love my sister and I was like, this is really nice. I'm not alone right now, but I also know that she's not there, but I also know that she is. And then finally I was ready to let go of the illusion. So I mm -hmm. sat up and looked at the empty bunk and then Whoa. it disappeared. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. I always hear, what sounds like AM radio. That's my main hallucinations is like, what sounds like music on an AM radio, like that kind of quality. And yeah. then, or it'll sound like the conversation in a crowded restaurant. Oh, like You can't yes. make out the sound. You can't make out any conversation, but it sounds like clinking. Like and voices. But it sounds like you hear like you're in a crowded restaurant. Like those are the two main hallucinations. Yeah. I got one where I was, um, there were, it was so creepy. There were two little girls whispering in my quarter mm -hmm. berth and I was like, is this cute or is this like the most terrifying thing that's yep. ever happened to my life? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I, I remember one time I was reefing the weirdest one I ever had. I was reefing and it was pretty gnarly out and it was nighttime and I heard myself from the cockpit say, <gasps> fuck. Oh my God. And I looked at the cockpit because yeah. I heard myself say it. And then I looked around and I just kept reefing. But it was, that was the weirdest one. But most of them are like, but the little girl's voices, for yeah. sure. It's this weird tonal sort of range. Like you can't hear what they're you can't make, saying. Exactly. You can't make out any of the words, but, but you, you can hear conversation. Yeah. 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 But I found if I listen to anything, podcast, audiobook, music, then I don't really get that as oh, much. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't listen to I almost never listen to anything at sea. Yeah, I'm pretty much... Even if I'm reading, I like to have music in the background mm -hmm. really softly just to... Yeah. And then if it's bad weather, I just <laughs> do the thing where I pretend it's not happening. So I put on my headphones yeah, and exactly. I'm like, la, 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 la. Yeah. I definitely did that one night uh, in a bad situation. Um, so let's talk about loneliness. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you deal with loneliness at sea? I get this asked this question a ton. I'm sure yeah. you do as well. Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about your perspective on loneliness you know. Yeah. I don't really get lonely at sea. That's the thing. Usually the first, I, I think this is the case with anyone on a boat. The first day or two out is hard because mm -hmm. you're transitioning from the speedy pace of land to the nothing is happening until everything is happening <laughs> pace of sailing. And then I, maybe I'll feel lonely at sunset. Um, mm -hmm. but then after that, I just, yeah, I don't know. I love spending time with myself when I'm at sea. I don't get lonely, but I do get lonely when I anchor up and the sailing is done and i'm like you know what i'd really love right now is to just talk to someone one thousand percent yeah i love solo ocean passages yeah same i love them it's really i special. honestly can't think of any time where i've been like i really wish someone was here ever yeah but in fiji yeah when i was in and you'll know this perfectly when i was in the yasawa caves by myself yeah i was like damn right exactly i wish so, someone was here we could look at each other and be like this is madness yeah. this is crazy or exploring any of these crazy places we've been yeah that's when i feel the loneliness yes yeah, it's like even if there's other boats around it's not 
But that's why it's because yeah. there's other boats yeah. around. So you see that there are other people. And the thing is, everyone is really friendly. But yeah. it takes a lot to put yourself out there mm -hmm. as an alone person. Yeah. To be like, hello, let's be friends now. I'm going to be all interesting so that you want to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, I tend to keep to myself, you know, I was raised to not bother people. So I literally just, like, keep to myself unless yeah. I have a reason to interact. I mean, I guess the difference is... If I see someone out or I see their flag, you know, what country flag they have. Yeah. If I if they're out, then I'll dingy by and, and chat it up with every yeah. boat in the Anchorage. I've done that a ton. Yeah. Um, because I like to hear where people are from and all that stuff. And also, I'm part of the Ocean Cruising Club, so if they have a burgee, then instantly I know that I have, like, friends that could be, like, family. Because uh, everyone in the club, literally, I've met so many good friends that when I see their birdie flying, I go over and I'm like, what's up? Oh, maybe I should pretend I'm in that ocean cruising. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> it's the flying fish, right? Mm hmm Yeah, it's an outstanding organization. Fantastic. Um, like, well, I'm not so, in the ocean cruising club, yeah. but I see that you are. Yeah. And I'm... <laughs> oh, nice. I see you're in the ocean cruising club. That's cool. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good lead. Cool fish. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you're getting ready to head back to the islands. You're in New Zealand now. Yeah. And um, you're going to be solo to Vanuatu. Yep. And how many, how far is that? Uh, it's about 1,100 miles, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, so depending what happens with the wind, 11 to 14 days. I think. Yeah. Sort of. And we've we've both been, we actually met in Fiji. I actually anchored by next to her, not knowing that it was Holly. Um, I had written a Holly when I was in Hawaii because I had heard so many horror stories about French Polynesia. And so my friend Tim, uh, fish name six, he wrote to me and he was like, reach out to Holly. She's been there a long time. You know, ask her what the situation is. So I wrote Holly and I was like, what is happening? Like, mm -hmm. what's the deal with cruising in French Polynesia? I heard all these horror stories and she wrote me back. She's like, if you, you know, she's like, it's fine. She's like, if you don't act like an asshole, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, don't anchor in front of people's houses. Be respectful of the people. And literally that advice, seriously, I was considering not going. Mm -hmm. And so That's based really on Holly's sad. advice, and I didn't know her, we just, I we had never communicated before. I just wrote her and based on what she said, I was like, that makes sense to me. So I went and I didn't experience anything yeah, so about what I read. Yeah. Everybody was nice. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, you just need to respect the locals. And, and that sh that's a given everywhere, I think. Yeah, but, yeah. but people don't in Polynesia. they Because the two Amodus, it's like long miles and miles, like 20 miles of one straight piece of land. And you can anchor anywhere. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, well, yeah, there's places where people have their homes and they don't like sailors anchoring. And sailors do anyway. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take long to figure out that they don't like it. Yeah. And it's really not that hard to just go over to the side. There's always areas with no houses mm -hmm. and then they see that you're doing that and they yeah i don't know it's funny i think a lot of it especially in the societies that charter scene over there is out of control so it's like all the chartered multi-holes like it's people showing up with credit cards who don't aren't sailors necessarily and don't respect the culture yeah. and literally they just like drive their boats wherever drive them up onto coral heads and i yeah. saw crazy stuff and had you know in the short time I was in the society. So I think a lot of that has soured a lot of the locals. But again, yeah. especially us in small boats, yeah, it's they less can of a thing. More to mm -hmm. us too. Yeah. Um, so you're going to head to Vanuatu. And what's the plan after that? Uh, towards Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by. I think I'd like to be there by November. So you want to do Vanuatu, maybe New Cal? Yeah. And then Australia? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes sense. Yeah, and then try to cruise up to Darwin, um, and then, yeah, I just keep going west, I guess. Yep. Spend some time in Indonesia, and then from there it's a giant question mark. Maybe yep. do another season, maybe go to India, Thailand, who knows. The same just with me. See how it feels. Like, I have my plans up to Phuket, and then it's kind of like, I have like five different options from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a whole part of the world that I don't really know anything about cruising-wise. I've backpacked all through there, but, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know anything about the sailing culture. Yeah. So... Now let's talk about you as a young female soloer, female traveler. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have to young women who want to do this but are nervous about the security aspects? Have you had any situations where you felt uncomfortable? Or have you taken measures to make sure that you kind of safeguarded yourself from like dangerous situations? 
yeah, I mean, I'd say just always anchor in places where there are other boats if you feel unsafe and anchor close to other boats and you can even, yeah, I've definitely felt unsafe and I've had situations where I'll take the handheld VHF to bed with me and I'll tell my friends, Mm -hmm. like, can you leave your radio on? And then I know I can call them Mm -hmm. if I feel unsafe because sometimes you get a feeling for a place and I think that all the women watching will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, We're always so tuned in to everything and the way people look at you and interact with you and um yeah there's definitely been times when I've felt unsafe there's been times when I've locked myself into my boat at night a lot especially Panama parts of um there was one island in Fiji where I was with another female solo sailor and we both got this feeling about the place and we kept VHFs on all night Mm -hmm. with for each other um and yeah, it's just it's just part of being a woman, right? No matter what you're doing, backpacking, yep. sailing, it's always on your radar. Mm-hmm. And I've thought through so many scenarios, like what would I do if this? What would I do if that? And it's just something that you have to deal with. Yeah, I don't really like. There isn't an elegant answer, but find your community. And even if you don't know anyone in the anchorage, if you say, "Hey, I feel kind of uncomfortable. Can we stay? Can you leave your radio on tonight?" People will. They're very friendly. And, and the reality is, most boats. Most boats have a female on board. Yeah. You know, even if you just want to, like, mesh with that, you know, with yeah. the wife or the grandma or whomever. And they'll get and it. And be like, you know, I feel uncomfortable. Can can you kind of be my safety net? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's fantastic. That is really good advice. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously that hasn't, like, slowed you from your adventure. No, but it's definitely soured some of my experiences. I bet. Mm-hmm. But I can't let it stop me. Because... Mm-hmm. That would be sad. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we were, we were talking about this yesterday where the difference is in, like, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Like, I have a public tracker where people can see where I am whenever. <laughs> um, and that's definitely something that Holly couldn't do safely, um, especially being, like, a public figure. Yeah, I don't tag myself. I'll tag places where I was, but I never exactly. even tag where I am mm-hmm. on Instagram yeah. or anything. Yeah, and and even with me, I've had creepy situations to where I've had people email me drone photos of my boat with me sitting in the cockpit huh? with no explanation. <laughs> They're, and it's literally like if someone was in your backyard photographing you through your kitchen window. Yeah, that's And it's really happened more creepy. than once. It's not like once. It's probably happened four or five times. And I, and have people just show up and knock on the boat. Hey, can I come aboard? And, you know, so. But that's all part of being like, a public personality yeah. with the sailing channel. That's maybe be, though because because I've had people send me like, oh, I saw you sailing and I took this picture of your boat, which I really appreciate. Mm-hmm. Maybe because you're a dude, they feel like they can invade your privacy a bit more. It, Whereas because I'm a woman, they're like, oh, I don't want to make her uncomfortable. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so you get more of that. It is pretty wild. Yeah. Do you have people stop by your boat randomly? Oh, definitely, but mm-hmm. no one invites themselves on yeah. board. They. Like, they sit in the dinghy until I ask them, which I usually don't. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I'll chat with them. Yeah, especially my boat. Our boats are so small. It's like... Plus, I don't I don't know them. I mean, yeah. I've made some awesome friends mm-hmm. from people who've approached me and said, you know, I watch your channel. Mm-hmm. And they're... Oh, Clark. The guy uh-huh. you just met. They uh-huh. watched my channel. And then I became really good friends with them. But it's... Yeah, not most people. Yeah, for usually sure. Usually it's just, like... I love meeting people who watch my channel. Mm-hmm. I think it's really fun. I've definitely made some really, really, like, lifelong friends. Yeah. Through the channel. And just great sure. interactions. Mm-hmm. I've never, I don't think I've ever had a negative interaction from someone I've met. I've had one really bad interaction. But other than that, mostly good. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, is there anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to touch on? Mm. I think so. Oh, I, one more thing I was going to ask you. So... At some point, you think you'll write a book when you're done? Yeah, I want to. I do write, but really, like, <laughs> like oh, I have this memory from here, and then this memory and that memory, and it's like a puzzle. Yeah, that's but all. that's like when you get down to writing a book, even if you had someone help you organize all that. Yeah. But that's definitely something. You'll be writing about this at some point. Yeah, definitely. And publishing a book. Yeah, I want that's to. That's awesome. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. We're going to wrap it up, and um, thanks for watching, and check out holly's youtube channel make sure you hit that subscribe button and thanks for watching or listening if you're tuning in to the audio version of this um and if you're on youtube get down in the comments tell us what you thought 
And again, in the description of this video will be a ton of links for everything you can want to know about Holly. So thanks, yeah, thanks for, for coming on. Me. Yeah. And um, fair thanks winds until next time. Yeah. Peace out. I want to give a big thanks to my guest for joining me for this episode of Yarns, Conversation with Cruisers. The intro and outro songs are sung by Sarah Satya, with lyrics to the old tune rewritten by myself, James Frederick. You can find any relevant links for the guests in the description of this video. Thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. When I was a little lass, my told me where all the way will all the way Joe. Someday your love will call and take you out to sea. Way all the way will all the way Joe. The storms will rise and waves shall fall in new lands you shall see. Way all the way will all the way richest boy will be the stories that you bring me way all away we'll haul away together